Thank you. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm going to be talking about quantum computing and Holland problems. So this, this is something slightly different uh, from the talks that we had yesterday. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is actually classical computer science. Um, so I'm interested in looking at um, computational counting problems. So these are a special type of computational problems. And I'm analyzing their complexity. And the reason that I'm talking to you here about this at this quantum conference is because I'm doing so using methods and knowledge from quantum theory. So um, this is not um, trying to um, solve these problems on a quantum computer. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm making use of um, knowledge that has been um, kind of invented in the quantum community in order to analyze the classical complexity of these problems. And the specific family of problems that I'm looking at is called Holland problems. Um, so some of you might have heard me talk, uh, heard me talk about similar topics before. Um, rest assured that there will be some new material in this talk. Uh, so kind of the first part is, is stuff that I've previously presented, and the second part is, is new work, which I've done together with Leslie and Goldberg. Right, so um, my talk will be structured as follows. I'll first give some introduction to the background of what I'm talking about. I'll introduce you to this concept of Holland problems and talk a little bit about um, the computational complexity of counting, because that's an area that I think people might not be familiar with. Um, I'm then going to talk about a couple of um, uh, complexity classifications. Um, for two families of problems called um, Holland plus and Holland C. I'll define what those are in a little while. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to kind of move to a slightly different setting. So the first part is going to be about exact counting. Um, and the second part is going to be about, about approximate counting. Um, and again, um, I'm going to give a new complexity classification. Um, and I'll show you how kind of tools and knowledge from quantum theory, in fact, sort of things that are fairly basic and well-known, um, like very widely known in the quantum community, actually give us a huge advantage in analyzing these classical problems. Right, uh, so let's start with the background. Um, to kind of motivate um, why these Holland problems are interesting and how they're related to quantum theory, um, let's start by looking at um, a different kind of problem, namely classical simulation of quantum circuits. Um, so. Um, Assume you you've got some circuit um, over some, some gate set. Um, so we, we fixed the gate set in advance, um, some specific set of things that you're allowed to use. And in addition to having the unitary part of the circuit, uh, we're also going to fix specific states that each qubit starts in at the beginning, and some other set of, um, some specific state for each qubit to be in at the end. And then this, this kind of closed circuit object here um, is associated with a complex number, um, which is the amplitude for this process to happen. Um, which we can compute by um, taking the tensor product of the initial states, applying the unitary, and projecting onto the final states. And so we can define a computational problem, which we'll try and solve on a classical computer, uh, which I call strong quantum circuit simulation. Um, and it's parameterized by the set S of operations that we allow in our circuits. Uh, so S is both the unitary gates, and it also contains all the allowed initial and final states that things are allowed to be in. Um, and uh, so uh, an instance of this computational problem is given by, by a description of some quantum circuit over these operations. And then um, the output that we want um, is the amplitude for that circuit. Um, there is a sort of little snag that we have to be careful about. If we allow our gates to, and our operations to be parameterized by arbitrary complex numbers, then we might not be able to compute this amplitude on a classical computer. Um, and that's why throughout this talk, um, I'm always going to restrict myself to algebraic complex numbers. Uh, so algebraic complex numbers are exactly those numbers that we can do um, efficient computation with without needing to worry about uh, kind of the number not being computable itself. Uh, so I, um, I'm going to occasionally mention this, this algebraic thing, but uh, throughout the talk, um, everything is always just going to be algebraic. So even if I forget to mention it, just keep that in mind. Okay. Um, so this, this is the idea of strong classical simulation of quantum circuits. Um, let's now kind of generalize this um, in order to um, get to Holland problems. Um, so the idea is that rather than having a circuit, we now have some graph. And to each vertex in that graph, we're going to associate a quantum state from a fixed set. Uh, so this set kind of takes the place of our set of operations that we had to start with. Um, we just now consider everything to be states. Um, and so we'll assign these states um, in uh, such a way that um, each qubit in the state um, corresponds to one of the edges incident on the vertex. So for example here, um, this first vertex has four edges incident on it, um, the loop counts as two, and so psi1 has to be a four qubit state. And um, our instance has to specify which qubit in psi1 corresponds to which edge. 
Similarly, psi2 here has to be a five qubit state, and psi4 is a two qubit state, and so on. And then we can associate a complex number with this object, um, with this graph, um, together with the quantum state, um, which is called the Holland. And we compute this number in the following way. We take the tensor product of all the states associated to the vertices, and then we project each edge onto the Bell state 0, 0, plus 1, 1. Um, so because each qubit is associated with an edge and we project out each edge, that again gives us a complex number, um, and this number is what we call the Holland. And in the, um, uh, in this computational problem, Holland of S, um, is just the problem where we're, we're given one of these graphs with the quantum states, and we're asked to find the value of the Holland. So throughout this talk, um, this, this is the computational problem that I'm going to be talking about. Um, for those of you who are familiar with tensor networks, there is a different way of looking at this, um, which may be more familiar. Uh, so we can also, rather than thinking about quantum states, uh, we could think about um, tensors. Uh, so um, uh, we, we still have this graph, um, but now to each vertex in the graph, we assign a tensor, and each edge in the graph gives us a contraction of indices. So each, each index in, in, this, in this tensor corresponds to one of the edges that's incident on the vertex, and then um, each edge gives us a contraction. And because we have no, no open edges left, um, that means we're fully contracting the tensor network, uh, so the outcome has to be a scalar, um, which is a complex number. And so th this is an alternative way of looking at the same problem. Um, but throughout this talk, I'm going to be using um, the language of, of quantum states and projections, um, because that's the one I'm more familiar with. Um, but if you're um, someone who works in tensor networks, then um, please um, feel free to think about it in terms of tensors. Right, so what kinds of problems can we express in this way? Um, so I started um, telling you about Holland problems as a kind of generalization of this idea of classical simulation of quantum circuits. So of course, simulating quantum circuits is one of the things that we can express in this framework. Um, there are also a, a huge range of other problems that can be expressed. Uh, so for example, um, various combinatorial properties on graphs, um, like counting the number of perfect matchings of a graph. Um, uh, so perfect matching being a um, subset of the edges in, um, chosen in such a way that each um, vertex is incident on exactly one of the edges. So for example, this edge up here and this edge down there together form a perfect matching. And if you want to count all of the matchings, then that's something that we can express as a Holland problem. We can also express um, various partition functions from statistical physics in this Holland framework. Um, for example, in the Ising model or the monomer dimo model. And there's also a whole other framework for counting problems from um, uh, classical computer science, which is called counting constraint satisfaction problems. And these problems can also be expressed as Holland problems. Uh, so this Holland framework, um, kind of one of the reasons why classical computer scientists are interested in it, is because it allows us to express this very wide range of um, computational counting problems. Right. So as I said, um, we're not actually interested in this talk in, in solving these problems outright. Instead, we're looking at analyzing their complexity. Um, and because um, these are counting problems rather than um, decision problems, um, the kind of complexity classes work slightly differently. So in a decision problem, um, those are the kind of standard problems that people talk about in computer science uh, where the answer is just a single bit. Um, but here we're, we're kind of trying to count the number of solutions of something um, uh, or even do something a, a bit more general which doesn't just involve counting solutions but each solution has a weight. Um, and so that's how the complex numbers come into it. Um, but anyway, so, so the idea is that um, um, our complexity classes, basically, they're, they're called different names, but they're kind of related to um, the complexity classes for decision problems, which are more well known. Uh, so um, the class that kind of indicates that a computational counting problem is hard uh, is called number p. And um, that corresponds to counting the number of solutions of some NP-hard problem. And so, of course, because if, if the problem is NP-hard, that means even deciding whether there is a solution is, is NP-hard. Um, and therefore, um, uh, uh, Counting all the solutions also has to be something that's computationally difficult to do. Um, again, there, there's a wide range of problems that are known to be um, uh, number p hard. Um, if we want to try and simulate a, um, a quantum circuit for a exactly universal set of operations, that's something that uh, we know to be number p hard. Um, and again, various other combinatorial um, uh, counting problems and also um, yeah, uh, a wide range of other problems are already known to be number p hard. So these are things that we can use um, in order to relate our new problems to and um, in that way show hardness. Um, the other reason why um, computational, uh, um, well, classical computer scientists are interested in this Holland problem is because um, 
so while it's a very kind of broad framework that covers a lot of problems, the complexity classifications that people have come up with so far all take a very simple form, um, uh, namely that of a dichotomy. So um, in the case of Holland problems, uh, we can, um, in, in all existing results pretty much, we can show that problems are either number p hard or they can be solved in polynomial time. Uh, so this is, this is an interesting result because in general people expect there to be um, computational problems that, are, that cannot be solved in polynomial time but also aren't as hard as all problems in the class number p. Um, again, this is, this is something that's equivalent to kind of a, a result from decision um, complexity where um, unless p is equal to np, there have to be np intermediate problems. So those are problems that are not polynomial time solvable but in np and not as hard as the hardest problems in np. Um, so we have, we have the same kind of result for counting problems in general, um, but somehow in the Holland framework, those intermediate problems just don't seem to appear. Um, so that means that our complexity classifications are particularly neat. And just to kind of quickly um, uh, sort of go over how, how we get our complexity analysis, so either we show that we've got some polynomial time algorithm um, for a problem kind of directly by just giving the algorithm, or we um, use what's called polynomial time Turing reductions, um, so we write this as A um, less than or equal PTB, where PT stands for polynomial time Turing. Um, if there exists some polynomial time algorithm for solving the problem A, given a polynomial time algorithm for solving B. Um, so if we have this kind of reduction and we know that B is a problem that has a polynomial time algorithm, then we know that A also is polynomial time solvable. And conversely, if, if we have such a reduction and we know that A is a problem that's hard, then we know that B must also be hard. And uh, so these reductions are the kind of main technique that we use in order to analyze our problems. Right, so how, how do we do those reductions? Um, so one of th the first technique that we use is called gadgets, and that's basically equivalent to kind of, um, in quantum circuits, if we have some limited gate set, we might define a new gate as a shorthand uh, for some kind of circuit over, over the gates that we already have. And we can do a similar thing in the case of Holland problems um, by kind of taking some, some small subgraph um, or well, it doesn't have to be that small, but it has to be a fixed size, and um, replacing it with just a single vertex with uh, the same number of external edges. And so in this case, if we have this small vertex with a um, degree three vertex uh, assigned the GZ state and a degree one vertex assigned the minus state and they're connected by an edge, then that's the same as having just a single vertex um, with the Bell state phi minus, so zero, zero, minus one, one. And in this way, um, uh, we can kind of construct um, uh, new new states to put into our set, and it turns out that if we if we take um, so uh, if we take the closure of our original set of states under this operation of taking gadgets, uh, we'll denote that by uh, these angle brackets with subscript h, um, and then for any subset of of this this new set um, of operations, uh, we have a reduction of the Holland problem for that new set g um, to the original set s. Um, by basically, um, we can always, um, if, if we have some, some, some one of these new states, we can always kind of replace it by, by the more complicated graph, and in that way we transform our original problem into one that only has um, the um, original set of operations, um, and therefore, if we can solve this problem, we can also solve that one. Okay, so this is one of our um, reduction techniques. Um, the second technique, which is actually the one that Holland problems got their name from, um, is called holographic transformations. Um, so uh, this is something that kind of um, uh, was a big thing in, um, in the computer science community because um, they, they, of course, don't express this problem in terms of quantum states. Um, so for them, these, these kind of operations um, actually sort of, um, yeah, were something very new and, um, and different. Um, but by looking at it in this, in this expression in terms of quantum states that I've ex um, uh, introduced to you, uh, it turns out that these operations of holographic transformations are actually just SLOCC operations. And in fact, they're a sort of restricted subsets of SLOCC operations. So we'll always do the same transformation um, on all the qubits in all the states in our set. So um, uh, we'll define this, this operation kind of formally by saying we'll take some invertible matrix. Um, and then if we have an n qubit state, um, then the matrix applied to that state uh, will define to just be the n-fold tensor product of the matrix with itself um, and that multiplied by the vector. And so for the, for the entire set, we'll say m applied to s is just equal to the transformations of all the states in the set. And in this way, um, we again get some kind of um, reduction because if uh, it turns out that our matrix wasn't just invertible, if it was orthogonal, um, then transforming all the states in our set by that matrix doesn't affect the complexity of our problem. Um, so um, uh, this is because we're just basically changing from, from one basis to a different um, 
equivalent basis, um, and that doesn't affect the complexity of, of um, computing this value of the Holland. So um, there are also some slightly more complicated holographic reductions that one can do, um, but I didn't want to go into these um, in detail here. Um, because uh, because of the way that our um, so the, the way that the problem is set up, we have to allow arbit kind of arbitrary instances. So there could be arbitrary graphs um, with, with where the states are connected up in different ways. And if if we um, didn't do these transformations in a symmetric way, it would be really difficult to analyze. Uh, so yeah, in, in theory, th there there are more complicated things you can do where you don't do the same transformation everywhere. But then you have to be very careful about how that interacts with the structure of your graph in different cases. Uh, whereas if you do just do the same transformation everywhere, that kind of makes makes life easy. Yeah. So so I, this this is not the only kind of transformation that you can do, but it's kind of the the, the simplest one to analyze, and so that's the one that people kind of start out talking about. Right, okay, so um, this was um, some of the reduction techniques that people use, the, the kind of two main ones. Uh, so let's now look at some of the results that already exist. Um, so the first one is a result for a family of Holland problems called Holland star. Um, the reason for this is that kind of a full complexity classification for all Holland problems is something that's, um, that's very difficult to attack and in fact hasn't, hasn't been achieved yet. So the way that people make the problem simpler to analyze is by um, saying we'll only consider sets of states that we know contain certain states. So in this case um, of Holland star, we say we'll only look at sets of states S um, that also contain all single qubit states. Um, and that means that if we want to, um, to um, construct gadgets, um, we know that we can use all single qubit states in those gadgets, um, and that makes life a lot easier. And so um, uh, there is a complete um, complexity classification for this problem Holland star, um, and again, it, of, of course, it wasn't originally phrased in kind of this quantum terminology, um, but by expressing it in quantum terms, we kind of find that the polynomial time computable cases um, for this problem, Holland star, um, kind of, um, it depends on the entanglement properties of the states in, in our set S, or rather in the closure of S and, and U undertaking gadgets. Um, so um, in the case that um, this closure undertaking gadgets only contains tensor products of single and two qubit states, um, the problem is, is easy to solve. And then there's two other um, cases, um, which are basically characterized by the fact that we have sort of GHZ type entanglement, um, but no W type entanglement, or we have W type entanglement, but no GHZ type entanglement. Um, and in, in those two cases, again, um, the problem um, can be solved in polynomial time. Um, but in all other cases, um, um, uh, the problem is number P hard. Uh, so if I have some time at the end, I'll, I'll show you exact definitions of, of, of what these things mean. Um, but for now, let's, let's kind of stick with the um, sort of intuitive high-level ones. Right. Okay, so this was Holland star. This was kind of the first, the first big um, complexity classification for Holland problems. Um, let's look at what other results there are. Um, so um, as I said, kind of for the full Holland problem, um, there, isn't, there isn't a full classification yet. Um, there are some partial results where people have made other kinds of restrictions on, on the states that they consider. So, for example, um, only considering states that are fully symmetric under any permutation of the qubits. Um, or um, there is a result uh, where we only have non-negative real coefficients in our states. Um, and then there's a couple of more of intermediate problems, and those are the ones that I'm going to be talking about in, in the next part of this talk. Um, so there's, there's one called um, Holland Plus, um, which basically I defined um, because it's, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't know how to attack this Holland C directly. So I thought I'll, I'll first look at this one um, because I, have, I had an idea of how to solve that. And then later, um, by combining um, uh, my work on Holland Plus with, with some new result about Holland C, this, this um, uh, dichotomy for, for real coefficients, I was then able to also get a full result for Holland C. And um, those are the two results that I'm going to be presenting in the next part of the talk. Um, but before that, are there any questions so far? Okay. Right, so next part. Um, a, an exact complexity classification for some Holland problems. Okay, so um, I've um, defined the problem Holland Plus on the previous slide, but let's just recap. So that's the problem where, in addition to the sort of specified set S, we've got the computational basis states and the Hadamard basis states available. So this is kind of significantly less um, uh, than having all single qubit states, um, but uh, it still it still gives us kind of a lot of uh, extra leeway when we're building gadgets. 
and it turns out that the complexity classification for this problem um, is kind of, it looks fairly similar to the one for Holland star, so we have all, all the polynomial time computable cases of Holland star here. Um, and then additionally, we have one new case, uh, which is that of stabilizer states. Um, so again, these, um, that the fact that stabilizer states are polynomial time um, classically simulable is something that was independently discovered by um, classical computer scientists working on these Holland problems, um, which I find interesting. Um, but yes, so, so, so this, this, this is the, um, the complexity classification for this problem, Holland Plus, and I'm now going to kind of walk you through um, a sort of high-level sketch of, of some of the steps of the proof and how knowledge from quantum theory really comes into that. Um, so the thing about match gates is that um, they're only classically simulable if you're on planar graphs. Um, you're not allowed crossings. Um, but in this Holland framework, we naturally allow arbitrary graphs. And so um, that's why match gates don't show up here. Um, there people have looked at some, um, uh, some results where they kind of treat planar graphs separately and then match gates do show up. Um, but yeah, b uh, because um, I'm not looking at any kind of properties of the graphs here, um, that's, that's why match gates aren't there. Right. Okay. Uh, so, kind of to give you a quick sketch of how, how the proof is going to work, and then we'll look at some of the steps in slightly more detail. Um, so, I'm, I'm basing my proof on um, another existing result, um, which is called, um, uh, which is a dichotomy for um, for the, for this Holland problem. Um, so, this this line in the middle says that here we're actually looking at bipartite graphs. So, this is an example of a um, Holland problem where we do make some restriction on the kind of graphs we consider. And we've only got, we've got a symmetric three qubit state on one side and a symmetric two qubit state on the other side. So that means we're actually even more restrictive. We're only looking at bipartite graphs where all the vertices in one partition have degree three and all the vertices in the other partition have degree two. And we're assigning each vertex in, in the first partition the same symmetric state and each vertex in the second partition um, this is the same symmetric state but a different one from the first partition. Um, right, so, so for, for this problem, there was an existing um, uh, complexity classification, and that's the one that I'm uh, wanting to use in order to show hardness. Um, and the idea is that, um, well, so first we start by, um, by looking at, at our set S that we start out with. Um, if we're in one of the known polynomial time computable families, there's nothing left to do because we already have the algorithm um, that tells us this problem is solvable. Um, uh, but in particular, if, if we have no multipartite entanglement, then the problem is polynomial time computable. Um, so from now on, we can assume that we have some multipartite entangled state um, in our set S. And then um, what I will show is that there exists some symmetric entangled three qubit state in the closure of S, the computational basis states, and the Hadamard basis states undertaking gadgets. Um, and I'll also show that we can find a symmetric entangled two qubit state in, in that same closure. Um, and therefore, um, and I will then plug, take those two states and plug them into this um, bipartite dichotomy up there um, in order to show hardness. Um, of course, there's a couple of things that we have to be careful about here. Um, so for one thing, I'm assuming that all the polynomial time computable cases are already known. Um, but I guess you can trust me on that because I already put the t theorem statement up there. Um, and the second thing that I'm assuming is that if the problem is hard, we can show this via the bipartite dichotomy. So again, that's also not something that's obvious a priori, um, but it will turn out to be justified. Okay, um, can I just have a quick check of the time? Okay, uh, right. So um, the first thing um, I, I did was um, so we have we have we know we have some multipartite entangled state in our set, um, but what we want is we want sort of two and three qubit entangled states. Um, so there is um, a um, actually fairly old result um, from quantum theory, um, which says that if we have some um, genuinely entangled state, um, then we can. Uh, we can choose any two of the systems in that state and project the other n minus two systems onto some tensor product of states in such a way that uh, the two qubits are left in an entangled state. Sorry, two systems. Um, th this result is, is for general um, quantum systems. Um, so that's, that's kind of a step in the right direction. Um, uh, so the, the original proof of this result in, in the 1992 paper wasn't quite um, uh, correct. and It was recently um, fixed. That's why there are two references for it. Um, the interesting thing about um, about the fixed proof is also that if if we um, if we look at the proof, um, so this is not explicitly stated in the paper, but if you follow the proof, it kind of becomes obvious that if we restrict our systems to qubits, um, then we don't need to allow projections onto tensor products of arbitrary single qubit states, um, but it suffices to only allow t projections onto tensor products of computational basis and Hadamard states, uh, Hadamard basis states. Uh, so that's why 
um, why I've allowed exactly those four states in, in the definition of Holland plus. Okay, so, so that's still, um, that's, that's kind of a step further, but it still only gives us two qubit entangled states, and we also need three qubit entangled states. Um, but I was able to kind of prove a more generalized form of, of this original theorem, which says that indeed, if we have some entangled state on at least three qubits, um, and we allow projections of individual qubits onto computational and Hadamard basis states, um, then we can always, um, then there exists some way of, of doing those projections so that we end up with a three qubit entangled state. Okay, so th this theorem is, is, is kind of more powerful than the first one in the sense that we can produce three qubit entangled states. Um, it's slightly less powerful in that the first one works for any choice of two qubits, whereas the second one only guar um, guarantees that there exists some choice of three qubits for which it works. Um, I'm not, yeah, I kind of have the intuition that it probably works for any choice, but I haven't been able to prove that. Um, so there's kind of an open question here. Um, let's um, kind of go over a quick sketch of the proof of how this works. Um, so my original proof of this was really complicated and unwieldy, um, but um, Mariami Gachichiladze and Otfried Gune pointed out that there is a much simpler way of proving this, so I'm presenting their proof here. Um, so the idea is that um, we prove it by induction. Um, the base case um, is if we start out with a three qubit state. So of course that's trivial because we've already got our desired three qubit entangled state. Um, we now assume that um, uh, the theorem holds for all n up to some k. Um, and for purposes of a contradiction, we'll assume that it doesn't hold for k plus 1. Um, so we'll consider some k plus 1 qubit fully entangled state. Um, and now if we project any qubit in this fully entangled state onto a computational basis state or a Hadamard basis state, that has to give us something that decomposes as a tensor product of single and two qubit states. Um, because if it doesn't, um, then we have some, uh, some entangled state of at least three qubits and then we can, uh, we, can we can take the induction hypothesis and use that to get to our three qubit entangled state. Um, but we assumed that we couldn't get to a three qubit entangled state from k plus one qubits. Uh, so that's why it has to decompose into those one and two qubit entangled states. Um, but we also know from the Popescu and Rolich theorem that for any pair of qubits in our original state, there exists some um, projection that will leave them entangled. Um, and it turns out that those two um, two statements here um, contradict each other. Um, so um, uh, it's, it's a slightly involved argument still, um, but basically, yeah, you can show that, that, that these two things just aren't compatible. And therefore, our assumption that the, th uh, the statement doesn't hold for k plus one had to be wrong. And so indeed, um, this theorem holds for any, uh, for any n. Right, okay, so we've now shown how we can get from some large multipartite entangled state down to a three qubit entangled state. Um, but of course, the state that we're producing isn't guaranteed to be symmetric. And in order to use the bipartite dichotomy, we need our state to be symmetric. Um, so what do we do? The kind of um, naive thing to do is basically to take three of those states and um, connect them together in this cyclically symmetric way. So here, the one, two, and three refer to the first, second, and third qubit of the state. Uh, so, so, so this gadget here is cyclically symmetric. Um, but because all the systems are qubits, um, it actually turns out that this is fully symmetric under any permutation of the qubits, not just on the cyclic ones. Um, on the other hand, um, this gadget is no longer guaranteed to always be entangled. So for some entangled three qubit states, um, this gadget will actually turn out to either be zero or be a product state. Um, but with a bit of work, we can show that if we are not, um, if our set S isn't one of the polynomial time computable families, then um, there always exists some way of making this gadget work to actually give us a symmetric three qubit entangled state. Um, and furthermore, um, we, can, we know that we can produce two qubit entangled states, um, and then with a little bit of extra work, we can show that we can make those symmetric, again, by kind of connecting two of them up um, together in a sort of symmetric way. Um, and it also turns out that um, uh, we can always produce these three qubit and two qubit states um, in such a way that um, the um, bipartite dichotomy actually says um, the problem is hard. And in this way, uh, we show that if we're not in one of the um, already known polynomial time computable cases um, of Holland plus, then the problem has to be number p hard. Right, okay, so that was the result for Holland plus. Um, let's now move on to looking at Holland C. Um, this is going to be um, a sort of uh, even quicker overview. Uh, so um, the idea, the idea behind the Holland C dichotomy is that we're kind of um, combining um, techniques from the Holland plus result that I've just shown you uh, with some results that were developed by uh, Sailu and Hia 
in, um, uh, in their dichotomy for real valued Holland C. Uh, so Holland C, um, uh, I've forgotten to put it back up on the slide again, it's the Holland problem where we've, we only allow the computational basis states in addition to the set S. Um, and um, yeah, so Sainu and Hia showed that um, if, if um, all of our states in S have um, algebraic real valued coefficients, um, then the problem is number p hard unless we're in one of the polynomial time computable cases of Holland star, which I've already shown you, or uh, unless we're in one of the polynomial time computable cases of this problem called number CSP2C. Uh, so um, number CSP2C is, is um, a Holland problem where in addition to the set S, we allow the computational basis states and we also allow GHZ states of even arity. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of the kind of um, uh, polynomial time computable families for that, but this is basically where the stabilizer states come in, for example. And um, there's, there's another polynomial time computable case of that as well. But yes, yeah, so, so how, how does this um, complexity classification work? Um, we kind of start in the same way as in the case of Holland Plus. Uh, we, we say, well, we assume we're not in one of the polynomial time computable cases, um, and in that case we have to have some multipartite entangled state. Um, and we're now going to, again, try and reduce the arity of the state, or the number of qubits, um, by um, uh, forming gadgets. But in this case, we've, we've got the computational basis states, we no longer have the Hadamard basis states. And there are some cases where pr uh, sort of measuring any qubit in the computational basis will disentangle our state. Um, so in that case, what we do is we'll, um, we'll use Bell projections instead. So in, in the Holland framework, these are kind of um, implemented by adding self-loops on vertices. Um, and then in some cases, um, uh, we can um, use this to, to get some ternary entangled state. Um, so in, in the case of this result by Sailu and Hia, they actually show that it has to have some specific form. And then they show that the problem has to be hard um, by a number of different lemmas, and some of those lemmas only work for real values, and that's why the entire result only works for real values. Um, uh, in other cases, um, because um, we might use these self-loops, which always reduce the number of qubits in steps of two, uh, we might, may not always be able to get to some ternary entangled state. Um, so in some cases, we might um, only be able to get to a four-qubit entangled state. Um, but it turns out in that case, the four-qubit entangled state always has a specific form, which either lets us um, construct GHZ4 using a gadget, or we can get GHZ4 by a different reduction technique, which is called polynomial interpolation, and which I haven't introduced to you. It's, it's slightly more complicated. Um, but basically, um, that allows us to, in some cases, kind of add states to our set without increasing the complexity, um, even if those states aren't realizable as gadgets. And it turns out that if we have this GHZ state of arity 4, um, that makes our problem equivalent to this number CSP2C. Um, and uh, in the same paper, um, these authors also show a full dichotomy for, for number CSP2C. And this full dichotomy actually works for complex coefficients. Right, so um, this is the um, Holland C classification for real values. Um, let's now look at um, the Holland C classification for complex values. Uh, so we'll basically do this by combining techniques from the Holland Plus uh, dichotomy um, with the ones uh, from the real valued Holland C dichotomy that I just showed you. Um, so we start in, in the usual way by picking some multipartite entangled state, having assumed that we're not in one of the polynomial time computable cases, and we reduce the arity um, by connecting it with computational basis states or with um, self loops. Um, and then if we get some entangled um, three qubit state, um, we proceed in the same way as in the case of Holland Plus. Um, so either we show that the problem is easy, that we actually had to be in one of the polynomial time computable families, um, or we show that we can um, reduce from a hard case of this bipartite dichotomy. Uh, so in some cases we have to do some extra work um, to, to get this to work. Uh, we basically have to make gadgets for additional single qubit states that aren't in the computational basis. Um, but it turns out that we can, we can always make those gadgets. And then there's a second case uh, where we can't get to a three qubit entangled state, but instead we get a four qubit entangled state. And in that case, we basically proceed exactly as on the previous slide. Uh, so we either um, get a gadget for GZ4 or we interpolate it. And then we use this um, uh, dichotomy for number CSP2C. Right, so that gives us um, the following complexity classification. Um, so for the problem Holland C, which is the Holland problem for the set S together with the computational basis states. Um, and our polynomial time computable cases are the same ones um, from Holland star. Um, we again get stabilizer states, in this case actually up to certain SLOCC operations. 
so there are some changes of basis that we can do um, that will keep us within um, within the stabilizer set, or at least that will kind of be uh, that we can undo. Um, and then there's a new um, polynomial time computable case, um, which um, is related to stabilizer states, but in a slightly weird way. So this is actually where um, uh, where uh, kind of non-symmetric holographic transformations, non-symmetric SLOCC operations come in. Um, so the idea is that um, if we have a set of states where all states have the following property, um, uh, if we take some, some bit string in the support of the state psi um, and we apply T gates to psi whenever um, the bit string has a one, um, then we want the resulting state um, to be a stabilizer state. So we've applied T gates, so our original state wasn't necessarily a stabilizer state itself. Um, but we want this to work for all bit strings in the support. Uh, so this is a slightly kind of confusing condition. Um, I forgot to put um, the example on the slide, so um, I think the simplest example of a state that isn't a stabilizer state but does satisfy this property is the state, um, is the, the two qubit state, zero one, um, plus e to the i pi by four times one zero. Um, so yeah, I should have put a slide in to show that to you, uh, sorry. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so this is kind of kind of an interesting set um, that's related to stabilizer states, but 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 isn't really. Uh, but nevertheless, um, the um, Holland problem is polynomial time computable for these. Right. Um, so this was um, kind of um, the the middle part of my talk um, about exact classification of Holland problems. Are there any questions so far? Figure. I've not looked at that, um, so I'm yeah I'm not sure there's like ma any terribly interesting unitary operators in this, so um, I I don't quite know about um, yeah magic state distillation. I mean the other thing is that as soon as you combine them with anything that isn't in this set, it probably gets hard. Um, so um, yeah I'm I'm not quite sure whether they're useful, but that's that's a good question. Um, don't. Um, so no, you can't view them as stabilizer states with T gates on all the inputs because um, so the condition says we want um, we want to be able to apply T gates when, um, for all bit strings in the support, but only where the bit string has a one. And so if you have, I guess if if you have a, a state that has support on the all one bit string, then yes, you can you can put T gates on all the inputs. Um, but but if you yeah if if that bit string isn't in your support, then putting T gates on all the inputs wouldn't necessarily give you a stabilizer state. Right. Okay. So um, yeah, that was um, what I wanted to say about exact classification of Holland problems. Let's now kind of move on and talk about something a little bit different, um, namely the complexity of approximating Holland values. And um, so this part of the talk is joint work with Leslie Goldberg. Um, so in order to kind of look at the, compl um, the complexity of approximating Hollands, we're actually going to um, define two new computational problems, um, which basically kind of capture this idea of approximating um, the number. Uh, the reason it's two is, I guess, because um, computer sci classical computer scientists don't like complex numbers, so they try to kind of get back to real numbers by treating the norm and the argument of the Holland separately. Um, but really, these these two things, if you can approximate the norm and you can approximate the argument in these senses, then I think for basically most kind of um, uh, norms, metrics that you would put on the complex numbers, you can approximate them um, within that um, within that distance function. So um, let's let's look at the first one. So this is called Holland norm. So we're trying to approximate the norm of the Holland. We've got our set of states S, and we've also got an accuracy parameter kappa. And the instance of this problem is basically exactly the same thing we had before. So we have a graph, and we have an assignment of states to the vertices. Um, but now our output is slightly different. So rather than exactly computing the Holland, uh, what we're going to do is um, we'll separate two cases. So if the Holland value is zero, um, the algorithm can do whatever it wants. Um, so that means that if we uh, run the algorithm um, multiple times and we kind of get wildly different values, that has to be because the Holland value is actually zero. So um, just by running it a few times, we can find out whether the Holland is zero. And if the Holland isn't zero, then um, the algorithm has to output a number n, um, which is win within a factor kappa of the true value of the norm of the Holland. 
Um, and similarly for the argument, again, we have an accuracy parameter rho and our set of states s. Um, again, the instance is exactly the same thing that we started out with. Um, again, if, if the whole end is zero, then our algorithm may output whatever it wants. Um, and if, if it isn't zero, then it has to output a number a, um, which is close to um, the real argument of the Holland. But of course, um, the argument is only actually defined up to um, uh, like an addition of, of some multiple of 2 pi. And therefore, yeah, we again, we, we don't worry about kind of multiples of 2 pi here because they don't, don't really have an effect. Um, and here, um, um, this is actually only um, additive error. Um, but because the argument is in the exponent, um, it kind of has, has the same effect as the multiplicative error up here. Uh, so of course, kappa needs to be a real number um, which is greater than one, and rho needs to be um, some real number which is strictly between zero and pi. Um, um, otherwise, yeah, the approximation here doesn't make sense. Okay, so, so these are the two problems that we're going to, to, to be looking at. Um, and I guess if, 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 they're d if they're both easy, then, um, then we know approximation is easy. And if they're both hard, then we're going to say that approximation is hard. And I guess in theory, there might be cases where one is hard but not the other, but um, those, those aren't going to appear, so we don't need to worry about them. Okay, so um, this is just a quick recap. So we're going to be talking about Holland star. Um, this is exactly the same slide that I gave you before of the exact um, complexity classification for Holland star. Um, so Holland star means we have all single qubit states available in addition to the set S. And they're basically these three polynomial time computable families in the exact case, um, uh, which are characterized by sort of the entanglement properties of the states. And of course, if, um, if we already know that Holland star of S is polynomial time computable exactly, um, then we don't need to worry about approximation because if we can exactly compute the number, then of course we can approximate it. So really the interesting cases are those where exact computation is number p hard. Um, so in theory, we might we might think that there might be some cases where um, exactly computing Holland, the Holland value is number p hard, but we might still be able to approximate it efficiently. Um, but actually, it turns out that um, this is not going to be the case. So the problem is going to be either exactly computable exa um, in polynomial time, or it's going to be number p hard even to approximate it. And the reason for that is kind of interesting, um, and it's related to this closure undertaking gadgets. Um, so we're going to say that some set S uh, is universal in the conservative case if the closure of S together with all single qubit states undertaking gadgets contains everything. Um, so this, this word conservative here, um, uh, this is a bit of terminology from, um, from uh, some other area of counting um, problems, which basically just refers to the fact that we have all single qubit states available. Um, and we're going to show that if, um, so, uh, if we ha take some set of states S, um, it's either universal in the conservative case, or it is one of the polynomial time computable cases of the Holland star dichotomy. So there aren't any other um, uh, sets that aren't um, universal uh, once we add all single qubit states. How do we prove this? Um, this is again where kind of quantum um, knowledge comes to the rescue. Um, so the idea is we, um, uh, we start out uh, basically in the same way that we've done in kind of most of the proofs that I've shown so far. Uh, we start by assuming we're not in one of the polynomial time computable families. Um, we, um, uh, we pick some multipartite entangled state um, in our set, and we, um, we make a gadget for a symmetric three qubit state. Um, so basically exactly in the same way as we did in the Holland plus dichotomy. Um, we, we can also show that there are certain two qubit states that we can also um, make gadgets for. And then um, to get with, these, um, with these specific two qubit states and the three qubit state that we've g we have, um, we, um, it's actually possible to show that we, have, we, we have must have all two qubit states in this closure undertaking gadgets. And now the, kind of, um, the way that we bring in knowledge from quantum theory is that, well, two qubit states um, by kind of partial transpose, those are equivalent to single qubit operators. Um, and in fact, by, by combining our single qubit operators, and um, the GZ state, we can also build a controlled knot operator. Uh, so um, anyone among you who is familiar with the ZX calculus um, is going to recognize this diagram. So these round dots here, those are going to be assigned GZ states, and the square boxes are going to be assigned the state that corresponds to the Hadamard matrix. Um, and in that way, this, this entire thing here um, becomes equivalent to the controlled knot gate up to a scalar factor, which we don't need to worry about. Um, and we, we just said that we have, we have GZ states. Um, actually, I said we have a GZ class state, um, but because we have all single qubit 
um, operators, we can kind of map that GZ class state to the exact GZ state. Um, and then, again, we have all single qubit operators, so we certainly have the Hadamards, mods, and therefore we can build the control not gate. And then, of course, we have all single qubit operators, and we have control not, so we can build any unitary operator. And then by applying those unitary operators to product states, um, which we can make because we have all single qubit states, um, in this way we can produce arbitrary um, quantum states. Um, and therefore, all states have to be in this closure undertaking gadgets. Okay, uh, so we have um, we have all, uh, we've shown that we either have all states in the closure undertaking gadgets, or we're in one of the known polynomial time computable families. So indeed, that gives us our um, dichotomy theorem. Um, so um, uh, basically, for technical reasons, this is this is phrased as being about finite sets of states. Um, but um, yeah, uh, there, there's kind of some some argument in the community as to whether all of these results should only be about finite sets, or whether it's it's permissible to to argue about infinite sets of states. Um, uh, but you don't need to worry about that too much. Um, so. Basically, um, if we have some set of states, then either we can exactly compute the Holland, or um, uh, we can actually just add some finite subset of all the single qubit states to it, and that will make both the argument and the norm hard, number p hard to approximate. Um, and the proof for that goes as follows. Um, so on the previous slide, we showed that either um, the Holland problem for S together with U is polynomial time computable, or um, this set S is universal in the conservative case, meaning its closure undertaking gadgets contains everything. If the closure undertaking gadgets contains everything, then for any set G that we might pick, um, we have a reduction um, of Holland arg of G and um, some kind of, this is basically just an arbitrary um, uh, accuracy number that we, we can pick. Um, we, can, we can choose anything else within zero and uh, between zero and pi as well. And similarly, down here, the accuracy parameter, um, the exact number, isn't relevant. Uh, but anyway, we get these two reductions, both for the argument and for the norm, for, for any set G. Um, and then um, the kind of crucial part is that there exists um, some set G uh, for which both the argument and the norm are hard to approximate. Uh, so I don't want to kind of define this in detail because I'm running low on time. Um, but basically, there, there are ex sets G for which both of those problems are number P hard. And so now, um, uh, of course, if these problems are hard, then those problems must also be hard. Um, but uh, we actually said we, we only want to use a finite set of single qubit states up there, so we're going to need a little bit more work. Um, OK, so this is just recapping what we've just proved on the previous slide. Um, so if S is universal in the conservative case, then there exists some finite set G such that both of those problems are hard, and we have these two reductions. Um, but actually, if G is finite, um, then there are only a finite number of different gadgets in it, and each gadget has to be finite as well. So each gadget only uses a finite number of single qubit states. So actually, overall, we don't we don't need all single qubit states on this side. Um, it suffices if we just um, have some finite set of single qubit states there. Um, the, the the exact set will depend on on what's in in, in the set S, um, but in each case, we can always find some finite set U prime for which this works. And then. Um, yeah, basically, because we have this reduction and because we know that these two problems are number p hard, that tells us that the problems on the right-hand side must also be number p hard. And therefore, we've got um, the above complexity classification. Okay. Uh, so this is all I wanted to tell you about um, the complexity of approximating Holland problems. So let's kind of summarize what I've talked about so far. Uh, so I've introduced you to um, uh, this notion of Holland problems. They're a type of computational counting problem. Um, and they're kind of closely related both to classical simulations of quantum computations and also to contractions of tensor networks. Um, I've shown how entanglement and stabilizer states actually play an important role in the complexity classification um, of these um, problems. So uh, basically um, expressing the kind of polynomial time computable cases um, makes sense. Uh, it, it makes a lot of sense to, to, to talk about this in terms of entanglement. And um, I've presented to you kind of three new classical results um, which were derived using knowledge and methods from quantum theory. Uh, so one for um, this problem called Holland Plus, uh, one for Holland C, so these are both um, exact complexity classifications, or, well, complexity classifications under exact evaluation, and then also a um, complexity classification under approximation uh, for this problem called Holland Star. Um, right. 
Uh, so there are plenty of open questions in this area. So as I've already mentioned, um, there is still no full um, complexity classification for all Holland problems under exact evaluation. Um, there also isn't really like very much work on approximating Holland values at all. Um, so um, our result about Holland star is really the kind of first full complexity classification of any family of Holland problems under approximation. Um, so there is a lot more work to be done there. Um, as uh, kind of um, getting back to, to Vega's question earlier, I would, I would like to look more at Holland problems on special families of graphs. Um, so for example, um, uh, yeah, bipartite graphs is something that people have already looked at, but, uh, and, or planar graphs, but also um, I'm thinking it might be interesting to look at um, directed graphs, so even directed acyclic graphs, um, because that will get us closer to, um, back to the notion of quantum circuits. Um, and my hope is that eventually um, it might be possible to get some new results about the complexity of classical simulation of quantum circuits um, uh, via these um, uh, complexity results for Holland problems. Um, but we can only really trans kind of, I mean, easiness results um, transfer across very, very straightforwardly. Um, but in order to actually show anything about hardness, we're going to need to, yeah, basically um, massage the Holland problems until they look like a quantum circuit. Otherwise, the hardness results aren't going to carry across. And so that's why, um, why I'd like to look at, yeah, for example, directed acyclic graphs. Right, um, that was all I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Miriam. Are there more questions? Oh, you were shy. So I have one. In your generalization of popescu rolisch theorem, yeah. you went from two to three. Yes. Any idea of possibility of going to larger sets or impossibility of going um, to larger sets? No, but basically, the kind of the, the, um, the proof that um, Mariami and Otfried came up with, um, I think that works for, uh, for any number uh, n. Uh, so again, it, it only, um, yeah, it, it has the same kind of characteristic that it only shows you that there exists some subset of the qubits for which it works. It doesn't tell you whether it works for all of them. Um, but yeah, it's um, the, the same, the proof kind of generalizes um, to any n. Uh, can you give an intuition why just two SLOCC classes appeared, that is JZ and W? Like for many parties, there are more classes. Uh, uh, of yes, so um, I guess um, the point is that we can always, um, in order to, to prove these complexity results, we always reduce everything down to three qubit states because those are kind of, yeah, the simplest non-trivial case. And then, of course, at that point, we only have JZ and W to worry about. Um, and so, of, co of course, you, you might get um, more complicated kinds of states. Um, in particular, you, you get tensor products of, of, of different ki kinds of states. Um, but, but really, for the, for the complexity classification, it's only relevant whether you can produce JZ states or w and W states, um, or only one of the two. Uh, I have some questions about post-selection. So there, there were other talks about post-selection. Mm -hmm. There are connections between sharp hardness of approximations in quantum computing and being universal under post-selection. Do you know if any of these results can be related to some form of post-selection? Um, I mean, kind of, yeah. By definition, the, the kind of stuff that I'm talking about here is just, yeah, it, it, it seems to involve post-selection because we're fixing the kind of final states of the qubits. Um, I've yeah, I, I'm not actually very familiar with the literature on, on kind of post-selection um, in quantum theory. That's something that I should look at a bit more. No more questions? Let us thank Miriam again.